Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on, or is entitled, In the Crucible with Christ. The Crucible? Hmm. Does that sound like a good place to be? This is lesson number 10 in that series for September 3 of 2022, entitled, Meekness in the Crucible. Let's pray to begin. Our wonderful Father, we know that you were among the meekest people who've ever lived on this earth, and yet it's so hard for us as human beings, born selfish, raised selfish, to be meek. Lord, help us to understand some of the keys to meekness in this lesson is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When was the last time you heard someone in ordinary conversation talk about meekness or someone being meek? Do you hear that all the time? Can't remember a time. <laughs> meekness is defined as, quote, enduring injury with patience and without resentment. That is certainly something that no ordinary selfish human being would be interested in. Meekness is a word that is similar to the word humble. Not many people want to be humble either. In actual fact, meekness or humility, if exercised as Jesus exercised it, is one of the most powerful characteristics known. Think of the roles played by Moses and Jesus Christ, probably the two meekest people we know about in the Bible. Were they weak? Not at all. Meekness or humility is not weakness. We need to start out with that point very clearly. Meekness or humility is not weakness. You can only afford to be meek and humble if you know that, you know, things are going to be all right. I'd like to nominate Job in that group yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly. Think of what Moses went through and what Joseph went through along with Job in their early lives to prepare them for what they, they, what they did later. From time to time, does God allow us to be broken to prepare us in one way or another for what is coming and to be witnesses to others? Jim? Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 to 14. When the people saw that Moses had come down from the had mountain... Had not come down. Right, Don't it. skip the word the not. Word not that, <laughs> that missing the, the whole thing. Scripture, right? <laughs> Had not come down from the mountain, but was staying there a long time. They gathered round Aaron and said to him, We do not know what has happened to this man, Moses, who led us out of Egypt. So we make us a god and lead us. Okay, let me interrupt for a second. I mean, here you are at the foot of a big mountain you can see up most of the way up that mountain. And just before this happened, what, what else had happened? Thunder and lightning. That, that black cloud had descended. As far as we know, the black cloud was still there and there's lightning shooting out and a thunder and the whole mountain was shaking. And so Moses charges up the hill, up, up the mountain like that and disappears and, and weeks go by. And, and you know, what do you think? Is he still alive up there? He's gone. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, you can understand why they might say, you know, we don't, we think this guy's gone. Okay, go ahead. So in verse 2, Aaron said to them, Take off the gold earrings which your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. Where do you think they got, the, they got those gold earrings? Egypt. Egypt. They got them from the Egyptians, yes. So all the people took off their gold earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took the earrings, melted them down, poured the gold into a mold, and made a gold calf, bull calf. The people said, Israel, this is your God, who led us out of Egypt. Then I, mean, I want you to try to, I mean, I, this blows me away. Here he makes this metal, it probably wasn't very big, a metal gold calf. And there he sets it up there. This is our God who has brought us out of Egypt. Huh? It's a chunk of metal that we just made out of earrings. And he was the priest. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, verse 5. Then Aaron built an altar in front of the gold calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival in honor of the Lord. 
Early the next morning, they brought some animals to burn as sacrifices and others to eat as fellowship offerings. The people sat down to a feast, which turned into an orgy of drinking and sex. Now, where did that idea come from? <laughs> well, they got near and dear to their God, didn't they? That was... Max, I used to use that term. <laughs> they, 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 well, I mean, the, that's, the, this yeah. is the kind of stuff they were... You they had seen the pagans around them doing. Right. Craziness. Well, okay. the alcohol, it, it, uh, people could be led into about anything, I think. Yeah. Uh, my only point, uh, question, though, is that never seen anything supernatural. Uh, until this, the plagues. Uh, well, no, until the thunder, lightning, the, the whole, uh, or the, the mountain shaking, mm -hmm. and... Uh, that had to be something different, but in spite of all of that, well, he's gone, you know, yeah. never mind. He give us something tangible, something yeah. visual. Don't we deal with the same thing too, you know? I, give, give me the evidence. Yeah, well, what you see, go ahead, Dwayne, you're gonna say something. I was just wondering if um, Bezalel might have helped. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know, that, that I hope old. not. Yeah, me but, too. Yeah. You just, this is, this story just blows me away. Um, anyway, go ahead, Jim. Verse 7, the Lord said to Moses, Go back down at once, because your people, whom you led out of Egypt, have sinned and rejected Whose me. Whose people? <laughs> your people. Your people whom you led out of Egypt. This is God speaking to Moses. Sounds so like parents arguing about their kids, isn't it? Right. Okay, go ahead. Uh, verse 8. They have already left the way that I commanded them to follow. They have made a bull calf out of melted gold and have worshipped it and offered sacrifices to it. They are saying that this is their God who led them out of Egypt. I know how stubborn these people are. Now I don't, tr now don't try to stop me. I am angry with them and I'm going to destroy them. Then I will make you and your descendants into a great nation. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, why should you be so angry with your people, whom you rescued from Egypt with a great might and power? Now, what does Moses say? Your people whom you rescued from Egypt. Turn the tables on it. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Why should the Egyptians be able to say that you led your people out of, the, out of Egypt, planning to kill them in the mountains and destroy them completely? Now this is a very key sentence right there. Why, what is the reason Moses gives why God should not do this? Because the, of what the nations are going to say. What will the Egyptians think? Okay, go stop, ahead. Stop being angry, change your mind, and do not bring disaster upon your people. Remember, your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, remember the solemn promise you made to them to give them as many descendants as there are stars in the sky and give their descendants all that land you promised would be the possession forever. So the Lord changed his mind and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. American Bible Society. Good okay. Do you see a problem with this story? There, there's a lot to think about there. <laughs> okay. Would God really have abandoned the children of Israel to make a great nation out of Moses? Do you think God really intended to do that? What, did it, what does it mean to say that the Lord changed his mind? Remember all the other passages in Scripture, Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord and I do not change. Uh, Carrie, you want to read those next couple of verses there? Yes. Uh, Malachi 3, 6. I am the Lord and I do not change. We just heard that. Good news, Bible. Numbers 23, 19. God is not like men who lie. He is not a human who changes his mind. Whatever he promises, he does. He speaks and it is done. That's from the now, who wrote Numbers? In Moses. Moses. This is a continuation of this same story. This is not something long, long, long time later. This is Moses speaking. Go ahead. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's okay. the Good News Bible. 
I do not know of any way to explain Exodus 32 without a knowledge of the great controversy and an understanding of God's foreknowledge. Okay, let's interrupt there for a second. How does that help us? Well, if we recognize God is referred to as a father, mm -hmm. father has a duty to teach his kids. But education, sometimes you have to people have your students learn from more than one point of view and mm -hmm. see which one. That's that's one way of looking at things, anyway. Well, here's a possibility: God already knew what He planned to do with Moses. What was going to happen to Moses down the line a little ways? He was going to die and take him up to heaven. God is going to resurrect him, bury him, then resurrect him and take him to heaven. So now, we, understanding the great controversy, recognize that God is not only dealing with the children of Israel right down here, he has to deal with the onlooking universe. And he's, this story is like this because God is trying to show the onlooking universe it's going to be safe to let this man into heaven. Okay, why is it, what's special about this? God was, go ahead. Uh, God was allowing the, this conversion to take, conversation take place so the rest of the beings in the universe could see that Moses was a person God could trust and see that he was safe to take to heaven. The greatest evidence that a person is a real friend is shown when that person stands up for their person's, for their friend's reputation. That is what Moses did on this occasion. He did not even want his enemies, the Egyptians, to have a bad opinion of Yahweh, Israel's God. Think about that. He did not want even the Egyptians, their enemies, their mortal enemies. He didn't want those Egyptians to have a bad opinion of Yahweh, Israel's God. Having herded sheep for, herded sheep for 40 years in the wilderness and realizing how helpless Israel was then, Moses felt a great closeness to those people that he was now, quote, shepherding. He pleaded with God on their behalf. There are two significant lessons we can learn from this experience. One, God was giving Moses an opportunity to demonstrate how much he cared about those desperately disobedient people. Two, God's grace is needed most of all when we least deserve it. Moses was demonstrating his capacity to be like God. God himself. Wow. In Numbers 12, there's a fantastic story, moving on in the story here, about Miriam and Aaron complaining about the fact that Moses had married a Midianite wife. Now, if you know the story here, what had happened? Moses had, 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 worked, had spent those 40 years down in Midian herding sheep, working for his father-in-law, married to his, his, the father-in-law's daughter, and so forth, Zipporah, and so forth. And now the children of Israel gradually wandered down to that same area. They were, they're moving into Midianite territory. And if we had the con whole context here, we would realize that uh, Moses' father-in-law had brought his wife and his two sons to meet the children of Israel as they had come here. So for the first time, we have a family reunion. And all of a sudden, for the first time, Aaron and Miriam see Moses' wife and his two children. So that's what's happening here, okay? They called Moses' wife a Cushite. What does Cushite mean? From the land of Cush. From Cush. The land of Cush is another name for Ethiopia. But in fact, she was not an Ethiopian, although we cannot be sure that she did not have some Ethiopian blood. Notice some very important things in the story. So we know that her father was from what, what tribe? Jethro was from? Midian. Midian. Where did the Midianites come from? Uh, Northern. Right, what is now Arabia? One of the kids, who's the median is a split of the, there is he was, one of the He was one of the sons. And Abraham's sons. Of Abraham's son from Keturah. Remember, he was one of the descendants of Keturah and Abraham. So, um, notice some very important things in this story. God is no respecter of persons. Zipporah was perfectly acceptable to be Moses' wife. 
Miriam and Aaron were asked to step forward in front of the tabernacle so God could speak to them directly. Notice the words he spoke to them. So you can imagine, he calls out more, he said, Moses, Aaron, Miriam, stand right over here in front of the temple. They're standing there. He says, Miriam, Aaron, step forward. <laughs> What's happening to your blood pressure as that's going on? <laughs> well, go ahead. Let's see. I guess we're ready. Duane, it's your turn. Numbers 12 there. Uh, suddenly, the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, I want the three of you to come out to the tent of my presence. They went, and the Lord came down on, in a pillar of cloud, stood at the entrance of the tent, and called out, Aaron, Miriam. The two of them stepped forward, and the Lord said, Now hear what I have to say. When there are prophets among you, I reveal myself to them in visions and speak to them in dreams. It is different when I speak with my servant Moses. I put him in charge of all my people Israel. So I speak to him face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He has even seen my form. How dare you speak against my servant Moses? Wow. Just <laughs> crazy, craziness. I mean, what do you suppose they saw? The cloud comes down and a voice is coming out of the cloud? Is that what's happening here? That's what I envision. Probably. Okay, go ahead. The Lord was angry with them. And so, as he departed... Okay, I'm going to stop there for a second. This is one of the earliest verses in the Bible describing what God does when he's angry, when he exercises his wrath. What did he do? He departed. He departed. Go ahead, let's see what happens next. And, and that cloud, though, uh, in the New Testament, we're told was Jesus Christ himself. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay, go ahead. And so he departed, and the cloud left the tent. Miriam's skin was suddenly covered with a dreaded disease and turned as white as snow. When Aaron looked at her and saw that she was covered with the disease, he said to Moses, Please, sir, do not make us suffer this punishment for our foolish sin. Don't let her become like something born dead with half its flesh eaten away. Now, we don't know for sure what that disease was, but here's the older sister and the older brother speaking to the youngest, younger brother almost as if he's God. Mm -hmm. Think about that situation. Okay, go ahead. So Moses cried out to the Lord, O oh God, heal her. The Lord answered, If her father had spat in her face, she would have to bear her disgrace for seven days. So let her be shut out of the camp for a week. And after that, she can be brought back in. Miriam was shut out of the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on until she was brought back in. Wow. On another occasion, following the disaster at Kadesh Barnea, three men from the tribe of Reuben, led by Korah, a Levite, challenged the leadership of Moses and Aaron. We're talking about being meek and humble here, right? The story is recorded in Numbers 16. These rebels persuaded 250 other Israelite leaders to join them. There was some exchange of information. What happened next is recorded in number 16, 1 through 35. Charles? Korah, the son of Isar, from the Levite clan of Kohat, uh, rebelled against the leadership of Moses. He was joined by three members of the tribe of Reuben, Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and on, and on son of uh, Pelet and by 250 other Israelites, well-known leaders chosen by their community, they assembled before Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far. All the members of the community belong to the Lord and the Lord is with all of us. Why? Then Moses, do you set yourself above the Lord's community? Wow. <laughs> when Moses said this, uh, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, 
When you complain against Aaron, it is, it, is it is really against the Lord that you and your followers are rebelling. Then Moses sent uh, for Dathan and Abiram, but they said, we will not come. Then Korah gathered the whole community. And I, they want you to, I want you to notice here, let's make sure we get this full story here. Who is calling all the people together Moses. to face Moses and so forth? Who called them? Korah. Korah. Korah gathered the whole community and they stood facing Moses and Aaron. Okay, go ahead. Then Korah gathered the whole community and they stood facing Moses and Aaron at the entrance of the tent. This is serious business. Mm -hmm. Then uh, suddenly the dazzling light of the Lord presence appeared to the whole community and and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron stand back from these people and I will destroy them immediately but okay now everybody's gathered there God is speaking we see his gl glorious presence there and he's saying stand back Moses and Aaron I'm gonna zap all these people <laughs> quick, quick question now so, sorry to interrupt but when he's saying we're gathering the whole community, he's talking about the 250? It sounds is he like talking people. about the whole... He the whole sounds like he's talking about the, all the Israelites. 7,000 people. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay, go so ahead. But Moses and Aaron bowed down their faces to the ground and said, Oh Lord, you are the source of all life. When one person sins, do you get angry with the whole community? The Lord said to Moses, Tell the people to move away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Dathan and Abiram. Just, I mean, imagine God says, Okay, stand back from those guys. <laughs> Dathan and Abiram had gone up and were standing at the entrance of their tents when their wives, uh, with their wives and children. Moses said to the people, This is how you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things and that it is not by my own choice that I have done them. Then this man, uh, if, if the man die a natural death without some punishment from God, then the Lord will, uh, then the Lord did not send me. But the Lord does something. And if the Lord. If the Lord did something unheard of, and the earth opens up and swallows them with all their own so that they go down alive in the world of the dead, you will know that these men have rejected the Lord. As soon as he had finished speaking, the ground under Dathan and Abiram split open and swallowed them and their families together with all of Korah's followers and their possessions. Wow. I mean... You yes. can imagine the ground just opening up and whoosh, yeah. then it closed it Close again. Back. Wow. So then went down alive in the world of the dead and with their positions, the earth closed over them and they vanished. All the people of Israel who there fled when they heard their cry, they shouted, run, and the earth might, the world might swallow us too. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Then the Lord sent a fire that blazed out and burned up the 250 men who had presented the incense. Now, if you remember that the, the Moses and Aaron said, well, you guys, if you want to think you're going to be priests, bring your incensors and mm -hmm. burn some incense and whatever. So this is what was the final result with those people. But Korah's family, interestingly enough, remember he was a Levite, they did not perish. Apparently, they weren't in on his rebellion. Mm. They remained faithful and continued to write songs for the children of Israel. A number of those songs are preserved in the book of Psalms. I've so, never noticed that before. Well, you're going to read it right now. We're going to read it right now. Numbers 26, 9 to 11. And his sons, Nemuel, Dathan, and Abiram. These, these are the Dathan and Abiram who were chosen by the community. They defied Moses and Aaron and joined the followers of Korah when they rebelled against the Lord. The ground opened and swallowed them, and they died with Korah and his followers when fire destroyed 250 men. They became a warning to the people, but the sons of Korah were not killed. Mm. It's right there, clearly. But the problems had not ended. 
Notice how the rebellion continued. Numbers 16, 41 to 50. Jim? The next day, the whole community complained against Moses and Aaron and said, You have killed some of the Lord's people. <laughs> After they had all gathered to Okay, work. I'm, inter I'm going to interrupt here for a second. Okay, you're, sta you're all standing around, and God's God speaks up out of the cloud, and he says, Stand back from where these people are living. Moses and Aaron are standing over there on the side. God says, Stand back from where these people live. The ground opens up. They disappear down, the ground closes again, and now the and people... it's Moses' fault. <laughs> <laughs> then they're saying, Moses, why did you do that? <laughs> you know, there's <it's> just... <laughs> there's something that doesn't compute here. <laughs> right, right, right. I'm sorry, go ahead. After they had gathered together into protest, Moses and Aaron, they turned towards the tent and saw that the cloud was covering it was covering it, and that the dazzling light of the Lord's presence had appeared. Moses and Aaron went and stood in front of the tent, and the Lord said to Moses, Stand back from these people, and I will destroy them on the spot. The two of them bowed down with their faces to the ground, and Moses said to Aaron, Take your fire pan, put live coals in, from the altar in it, and put some incense on the coals. Then hurry with it to the other people, with to me, pray with it to the people and perform the ritual of purification for them. Hurry, the Lord's anger has already broken out and an epidemic has already begun. Aaron obeyed, took his fire pan and ran into the middle of the assembled pe people. Then he saw that the plague had already begun. He put the incense on the coals and performed the ritual of purification for the people. That stopped the plague and he was left standing between the living and the dead. The number of people who died was 14,700, not counting those who died in Korah's rebellion from the Good News Bible. Okay, so almost 15,000 people because 250 are already dead, now 14,700. 15,000 people died there, right? Boom. Yeah. That's are there people? Thumb. What? After that many less people you got to feed, huh? <laughs> well, that wouldn't be the first thing I would be worried about. No, but. And there are people, are there people with whom you have contact on a fairly regular basis who desperately need God's grace? Could we reach out to them in a meekness and humility? Remember, that's what our lesson is about. What about the beggars who stand on the street corners asking for money? Is it a good thing to stop and give them something? You know, the other thing that I, I keep remembering as I'm listening to this, reading it, during all of this rebellion, they're daily getting manna. And water. And, yeah. Yep. It never ceases. And before, then, before long, they start to rebel and complain about the heavenly food, manna. Yeah. <laughs> we were better off in Egypt. Give us the quails. <laughs> okay, Carrie, let's move to the New Testament now. Reading from uh, chapter 5 of Matthew from, and verses 43 through 48. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, Love your friends, hate your enemies. But now I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute them, mm. so that you may become the children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun to shine on bad and good people alike and gives rain to those who do good and to those who do evil. Why should God reward you if you love only the people who love you? Even the tax collectors do that. And if you speak only to your friends, have you done anything out of the ordinary? Even the pagans do that. You must be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect, and that's from the Good News Bible. Have you ever wondered how Matthew responded as Jesus made these comments about tax collectors? <laughs> he was one himself. <laughs> wow. What example did Matthew give to illustrate God's kindness even to his enemies? God does what? We just read. He sends rain to good. Yeah, good the rain and the sun, and the sun to the good people and the bad people, right? right? God was not talking about a warm, fuzzy feeling toward our enemies. 
He was talking about a specific action to reveal care and consideration for those who perhaps are least deserving. It is important in understanding this passage to realize that the Greek word for perfect actually means mature or even ripe when speaking about a fruit. This is not a picture of some unattainable goal. In light of, in fact, God goes on to promise, he said, I will, I will make you perfect if you just give me a chance. We don't have to attain that goal. In light of these examples we have just discussed, do you see characteristics in your own life that need to be changed? Jesus himself was the greatest example of true humility and weakness. And was he weak? <laughs> he was <laughs> the strongest person in the universe, right? 2 Peter 2, 18 to 25. Duane? They make proud and stupid statements and use immoral bodily lusts to trap those who are just beginning to escape from among people who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of destructive habits. For a person is a slave of anything that has conquered him. If people have escaped from the corrupting forces of the world through their knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then are again caught and conquered by them, such people are in a worse state at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been much better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than to know it and then turn away from the sacred command that was given them. What happened to them shows that the Proverbs are true. A dog goes back to what it has vomited, and a pig that has been washed goes back to roll in the mud. Wow. Many people had slaves in the days of Jesus and Peter. Some of those slaves were treated very badly. But Peter said that even those who treated their slaves very badly should have been obeyed on principle. Think of all that Christ went through without murmuring or complaining. True Christians look forward to an eternity living in a perfect environment of heaven, should be able to, offer, to suffer through times of stress and problems on this earth, even the seven last plagues, so long as they keep the future in mind. During most of those, by the way, how many Christians, how many real followers of God were going to die during the seven last plagues? None. None. They may, may be persecuted, they may have all kinds of problems, they're not going to die. God will not allow it. Um, during most of those hours when Jesus went through that last night and morning of trials and beatings, he just kept quiet. Here is one reason why. Charles? From the writings of Ellen White, Herod cautioned Christ in many words, but throughout the Savior maintained a profound silence. At the command of the king, the discreet and maimed were then called in. And Christ was ordered to prove his claims by working a miracle. Men said that thou canst heal the sick. And Herod, I am anxious to see that thy, uh, thy widespread fame has not been belied. But Jesus remained silent. Herod was irritated by this silence. It seemed to indicate utter indifference to his authority, to the vain and pompous king open rebuke would have been less offensive than thus ignored. Again, to be thus ignored. To yeah. be thus ignored. Again, he angrily threatened Jesus, who still remained unmoved and silent. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 729. So, the greatest rebuke he could give to Herod was to do what? Ignore him, totally. Just ignore him. Often the be best answer in trying to deal with those who are unfair and angry is silence. From the Bible study guide, so often the most proud people, the most arrogant and pushy, are those who suffer from low self-esteem. Their arrogance and pride and total lack of meekness or humility exist as a cover, perhaps even unconsciously, for something lacking inside. What they need is something we all need, a sense of security, of worthiness of acceptance, especially in times of distress and suffering. We can find that that only through the Lord. In short, meekness and humility, far from being attributes of weakness, are often the most powerful manifestation of a soul firmly grounded 
on the rock from our Bible study guide. True followers of God do not need to be afraid. We can claim God as our defender, our protector, and the one who will never let us down. We may suffer through problems, but we can depend on him in the end. And there's a whole psalm about that it's called Psalm 62, which we don't have time to read right now. Um, Jim? Without cause, men will become our enemies. The motives of the people of God will be misinterpreted not only by the world, but by their own brethren. The Lord's servants will be put in hard places. A mountain will be made of a molehill to justify them in pursuing a selfish, unrighteous course. By misrepresentation, these men will be clothed in dark vestments of dishonesty because its circumstances beyond their control made their work perplexing. <clears throat> Excuse me, they will be pointed to as men that cannot be trusted, and that will be done by members of the church. God's wow. servants. So let me interrupt there for a second. Some of the greatest critics of Christians in those last final days are going to be who? The ex Adventists. Former church members, yes. Okay, go ahead. God's yeah. servants must arm themselves with the mind of Christ. They must not, excuse me, thus not expect to escape insult and misjudgment. They will be called enthusiasts and fanatics, but let them not become discouraged. God's hands are on the wheel of his providence, guiding his work to the glory of his name. Ellen White, Spalding McGann Collection, page 370. What do we know about Spalding and McGann? They built up the University, now it is a university, it used to be, uh, well, what, and now it's Andrews University. Then when they have to, after doing that, they moved to the south and built up Madison College down there. And they were doing such a good job that they came to Loma Linda and built it up. And you can see uh, McGann's picture in the library over here if you go over there and look at the right place. Have you ever had to deal with fanatics? What is a fanatic? There have been two very extreme but opposite views as to what a fanatic is. One group claims that fanatic is an acronym for friends and neighbors all together in Christ. <laughs> That's a fanatic. <laughs> wow. Others suggest, tongue in cheek, that fanatics are people who do what Jesus would do if he were as well informed as they are. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you're immune to abuse and people who speak against you? Gary? This is from Mrs. White. The difficulties we have to encounter may be very much lessened by that meekness which hides itself in Christ. If we possess the humility of our Master, we shall rise above the slights, the rebuffs, the annoyances to which we are daily exposed, and they will cease to cast a gloom over the Spirit. Highest evidence of nobility in the Christian is self-control. Can I read that again? The highest evidence of nobility in a Christian is self-control. Okay. He who under abuse or cruelty fails to maintain a calm and trustful spirit robs God of his right to reveal in him his own perfection of character. Lowliness of heart is the strength that gives victory to the followers of Christ. It is the token of their connection with the courts above. And that's from the Desire of Ages, page 301, paragraph 3. Well, can humility and meekness help us to rise above slights, hurts, and annoyances? Unfortunately, there are many people who despise their true Christianity because of its emphasis on humility and meekness. Meekness is taught and exemplified throughout Scripture. Duane? Biblical religion in both the Old and the New Testaments is characterized by meekness. Moses is known for being the meekest person on earth. David declared that the meek shall inherit the earth. The prophets pronounced, the prophets announced, announced that God will bless the meek. Uh, numerous verses there. God himself is described as meek and as promoting meekness. Jesus was meek. 
and placed meekness at the foundation of Christianity. The apostles were meek and urged Christians to be meek. While the empires and kingdoms of the earth are constructed on such values as audacity, power, and military conquest, the religion of God builds and conquers with meekness, love, and grace. However, God's meekness does not mean that he is powerless. Rather, meekness is an essential trait of God's character and his way of relating to the universe and to us sinners. Okay, we're going to take a few moments now and study or read a few words from someone or a few words about someone who ended up being a huge influence on European civilization in the 1800s. He, interestingly enough, was born in 1844. Mm. The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche had very different ideas about meekness. He called it slave morality. And Charles, why don't you go ahead and read a couple of those paragraphs. This is fairly lengthy. We'll divide up this work here. One of the strongest uh, attacks on Christianity and this concept of humility and meekness in the modern period came from the German uh, existentialist philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Nietzsche, 1844 to 1900 not only was suffering an integral part of Nietzsche's life, but it was, all, was an essential area of interest in his philosophy. At the very young age, he lost his father and many other members of his family. Now, you don't know whether that's what influenced him somewhat or not. Um, Perhaps it did, huh? Yeah. Throughout his life, Nietzsche struggled with debilitating health issues and was eventually isolated by a mental illness during the last 11 years of his life. Oh, so as he's proclaiming all this crazy nonsense, he ends up in a mental institution. Okay. As he studied classical languages and philosophy, Nietzsche became especially interested in ancient Greek culture and philosophy. From the, this lens, he concluded that Europe had lost its ancient vigor. The culprit? None other than Christianity, of course. Nietzsche, <laughs> throughout Christianity, thought Christianity had robbed Europe of its classical Greek and Roman culture of heroism, power, and nobility. The West, indeed, humility in its entirety, according to Nietzsche, needed to redeem that classical outlook if it wanted to survive and thrive. Okay, let me interrupt for a minute. So what is this guy saying? He's saying the people who stand up and they're strong and they control other people and so forth, those are the real people. This idea that you need, need to be meek and humble, that's for slaves, that's not for real people. Real men don't do that kind of stuff. And right? the Christians are the, the slaves. They're the yeah. ones that have that uh, yeah, well, attitude. Yeah, Jews and Christians and as you might, we're going to read about a little bit later, many people believe that Nietzsche had a massive influence on Hitler. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. Yeah, so you can see where some of that thinking came from. You mix that thinking with, with uh, occult and spiritualism and all that, that, that Hitler and those uh, that he surrounded himself with, I mean, they, they were doomed. They were just, it was, you couldn't brought anything Nothing good could come no, out of that. No, no. <clears throat> okay, go ahead, Charles. According to Nietzsche, there are two types of morality. The morality of the masters, of the noblemen, and the strong-willed men, and the morality of the slaves of the weak. Master morality sets itself its own values, decides on its own course of actions, and evaluates them through the prism of their consequences, such as helpful, good, or harmful, bad. So you see, here's what, what he's saying here. You make up your own mind. You, you make your own choices. You, this is, you don't wait for God to tell you what to do or what's right or what's wrong. You make up your own mind. You know what's good, and, and then that's the way it is. 
that's autonomy, power, wealth, nobility, optimism, exuberance, and courage are regarded as good, while weakness and meekness are regarded as bad. By contrast, slave morality does not generate values of actions but merely reacts to and opposes the values of actions set by the master morality. While master morality forces on action, slave morality is reactions or as Nietzsche would put it, resentment. So in other words, he's saying these people who are humble and, 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 and meek, they don't, they don't do anything. They're, they're not leaders or whatever. Uh, they're just reacting what other people do to them. They're slaves. While master morality is oppressive, slave morality is uh, subversive and uh, manipulative. <laughs> wow, even accusing them. Huh? Yeah. While master morality is more individualistic, slave morality is communi communitarian. That's because of the weak and unable to overthrow the powerful by sheer force, they resort to reinterpreting and disparaging um, the value system of the masters. Instead of enjoying the morality of the strong men, the weak project their situation of humiliation into the absolute and device uh, universalizing. Uh, universalizing their values. So you see what, what he's saying here. He's saying, okay, these weak people try to pretend like they're somebody. They make fun of the masters, the people who are strong and powerful and whatever. They try to make fun of those people. And we, they want to put meekness and humility in place of, of that strength. That's upside down, according to Nietzsche. Okay, now you come to your other passage. According to Nietzsche, Christianity is a religion of the weak, of slave morality. In his own words, Christianity has taken the side of everything weak, base, failed. It has made an ideal out of the out of whatever contradicts the perseverance, perseveration, preservation of mm. instincts preservation instincts of the strong life. It has computed, corrupted. corrupted the reason of even the most spiritual natures of teaching people to see the highest spiritual values as sinful, deceptive, uh, as temptations. The most beautiful example, the corruption of Pascal, who believed that his reason was corrupted by original sin when the only thing corrupting it was Christianity itself. So Pascal said, we are, we are in this bad situation because we're sinners. He said, no, you're in this bad situation because you pretend to be Christians. No wonder, this is Hitler, you know, yeah. perfect. For Nietzsche, Christianity is another reaction of the poor and weak designed to overthrow and control the powerful through manipulation. So that's what Christianity does, according to him. Christians have resigned the, themselves to their fate of slavery and do not have the will to become masters of their own destiny. For this reason, they hypocritically denounce as sinful what the powerful people have and exalt as virtue what Christians cannot have, imposing their new morality onto all humans. Thus, because Christians could not overpower the rich and the powerful by other, other means, they devised a way to control the strong with their morality. In this Christian morality, for instance, Christians would convert their inescapable weakness and submission to other people into the virtue of obedience. And the Christian's inability to take revenge would impel Christians to invent the virtue of forgiveness. Likewise, they would design other virtues such as piety, love, reciprocity, and equality. No matter how noble these virtues may seem to many, for Nietzsche, Christian morality was unacceptable, irrational, and repulsive, because in, in his view, Christians used these virtues to reverse the morality of the strong and noble man of the world. So we got to get rid of all this nonsense to enslave and even to oppress him, 
to Nietzsche, Christian morality keeps people under control, keeps them in obscurity, and makes them ordinary, unexceptional. So, what is he saying? He's saying, you know, if you're wee, meek and you're humble, you're obviously a slave. You don't amount to anything. Strong, strong person is out there, you know, doing the good things. Obviously, Nietzsche's criticism of Christianity, Christian morality, and its fundamental concept of meekness is a lamentably wrong understanding of Christianity. The Christian virtue of meekness does not spring out of powerlessness, but out of God's power, justice, and love. When Jesus was taken to the Jewish court with one official, and one official slapped him, Jesus demanded an answer from that unjust act, John 18:23. The Gospels, let's just look at that quickly, John 18, 23. Jesus answered him, If I have said anything wrong, tell everyone here what it was. But I, if I am right in what I have said, well, why do you hit me? The Gospels make it clear that Jesus died on the cross not because he did not have any way of escaping. Clearly he could have escaped. He said, I could call 12,000 of my father's angels to stand up for me but because he voluntarily and lovingly gave his life for our salvation. And Nietzsche couldn't even comprehend that kind of something. Christian meekness is the result not of fear, but of love, from our adult, adult, adult teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Many people believe that Nietzsche inspired Hitler, and there's very good reasons to believe that. While Jesus, living on this earth, may have seemed at times to be weak, in fact, he is the most powerful being in the entire universe. His meekness and his humility are, not sign, are no sign of weakness. Nietzsche's criticism of Christianity is completely wrong. Christians choose to be humble and meek because they love people as God does. And what example do we have of that? Jim? Philippians 2 verses 5 to 11. Mm. The attitude you should have is the one that Jesus Christ had. He always had the nature of God. So he didn't, he didn't give, up, give it up, okay. But he did not think that by force he should try to maintain equal, to remain, me, remain equal with God. So what would Nietzsche have said about that? If you're strong, you, you climb the ladder, right? Well, Go ahead. that's Darwinism and... and yeah. uh, Sure. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked with the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. For this reason, God raised him up, raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than all, any other name. And so, in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven on earth and in the world below will fall on their knees and all will, me, and all will openly pre proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father from the Good News Bible. I want to look at two things in that passage. Phillips, in his paraphrase, when it came to about his death on the cross, he translated the death of a common criminal. I mean, the crucifixion was intended to be the most embarrassing, the most shameful way that a person could possibly die. And then it says... They crucified them naked. Yeah. And all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When it says all, how many is that? All. Oh. In all <laughs> beings in heaven, on earth, and, and in the world below will fall on their knees including Satan himself. The truth is that we are sinners and we have rebelled against God. As a family, we have departed further and further from God's ideal. Our realization of this fact should cause each of us to be humble and meek. There is no thing or person about which we can be proud except our Father God. Think of what he has done for us in addition to creating us. And so we have this passage, which is the only passage in Scripture where someone intentionally tries to explain why 
Jesus had to die. Carrie? Reading from Romans chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. God offered him so that by his blood, and in brackets it's got footnote, by his blood or by his sacrificial death. He should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in him. God did this in order to demonstrate that he is righteous. In the past he was patient and overlooked people's sins, but in the present time he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. In this way, God shows that he himself is righteous and that he puts right everyone who believes in Jesus. And that's from the Good News Bible. Yeah. Three times it says the reason Christ had to die was to demonstrate God's righteousness. So meekness is a part of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Charles, you want to read that for us? Or Duane, you can do it, I guess. Go ahead, Charles. But the Spirit pronounce, produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. There is no law against such things as this. Goodness Bible. And what do you think Nietzsche would say about those things? <laughs> this is all nonsense. Yeah. This is weakness. So, in conclusion, we see that Humility and meekness are not bad things. They're good things. They're characteristics of God, things we should want to copy. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we've come together today to think about humility and meekness, things that Satan would never want in his character, things he would never promote, things that people like Nietzsche, following Satan's example, laugh at and sneer at and make fun of. But Lord, we realize that it's only the truly wise, the truly strong, the truly godlike that are able to be meek and humble. May we understand that and exemplify it in our lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.